Um, and, and I'm so very, very proud of Pastor uh, Joey and Grace Church. God bless you. What a great job you're doing here. Give yourselves a big, this is awesome. I, I am, uh, this is exciting to, to be here with you. Um, it's an incredible privilege to go out on behalf of Baptist Bible College and just, just share the story of what's going on there. We have been through so much for so many years, and I'm so excited to see we're finally seeing some great big movements being, begin to take place there uh, on the campus and, and, and forward. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, that people may not understand, we, we have degrees that prepare a person to serve in a local church. To, to, to help you understand how to go to a foreign country and start churches there. But we also have education degrees and business degrees. And we have a lot of our students that are actually taking those degrees so they can use their life and as their ministry, whether it's in a public school room or a, or a business. And, and so I'm thankful for that. Um, we, one year ago, we started online degrees, 100% online degrees. So you could get a degree from Baptist Bible College right here in Kansas City, and, and I, I'm thankful for that. We have a lot of people doing that, so let me encourage you to think about that. We have degrees, uh, again, in ministry studies. We have degrees in, in um, business, and, and, and a degree that I personally head up is a degree in, in leadership, organizational leadership, Christian leadership. And uh, if you, if you are, are thinking about a degree, a degree in leadership will help you no matter what area you work in or you want to do. So let me encourage you to think about that. Uh, you can go to our website at gobbc.edu and, and learn about that. Well, this has been a powerful year, hasn't it? Um, and and it, it, it's been a disappointing year in a lot of ways. Um, didn't mean to bring up the Super Bowl or anything like that, but I, I'm, so, you know, I'm sorry about that. I, I'm a Cleveland Browns fan, and, and uh, so, so... But I root for you. I do. I root, I root for the Chiefs. You know why? Because, because all of Missouri is happier when the Chiefs win. So I, I, I want them to win. I do. I do. Um, so, but but our, our year has been difficult. Um, we, we, we all face an enemy that we can't see. You know, this virus that has taken over the world and affected so much, especially Springfield, has been on the national news a lot lately, and it's greatly affected our college and other colleges. Um, politics has been crazy. Uh, so, so many things in the news. Did you know that, that hot dogs have been in the news this year? I, I love hot dogs, a good hot dog. You know what I'm saying? Not, not, a, not a, a cheap, mushy kind, but a really good Grill hot dog, isn't, isn't it? It's as good as any. So, so did you know that hot dogs have made the news this year as well? As all the other things, so, so hot dogs. This year, on July 4th, one month ago, July 4th was on a Sunday, and every year on July 4th is the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Championship. You ever seen that? They used to show it on TV, but it's so gross that they stopped showing it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, on TV. This year, the, uh, another new world record was set. Joey Chestnut ate 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. He won his 14th mustard belt. You know what I'm talking about? The world championship belt. He broke his own world record. 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. Hey, have you ever seen this contest on TV? You ever seen it? It's the most disgusting thing you could watch on television. It's disgusting. It's just a shame what they do to those hot dogs. They are just, they're just cramming them into, into their mouth. Did you know that there, there's a whole league of competitive eaters? They travel from place to place and they eat things, you know? I, I watched a little documentary about these guys. They, they all have a cool nickname. One guy introduced himself, I want you to get this, as a faith-based competitive eater. And I thought, that's like a lot of us, isn't it? You know, right? He called himself the Billy Graham of ham. Amen? How about that? How about that? I, I, just, I just think about that, and, and it just amazes me. Every time I think about this, what some people live and die for. What he's living his life for. Four to, to eat to eat hot dogs. The other night I saw a guy on a late night television show and, and he was he was obsessed with paper airplanes. 
He bragged about how he spent the last so many years of his life inventing paper airplanes, making paper airplanes. And he had some examples, and they were really cool, if that's what you want to do with your life, you know? Uh, have you ever watched some, some, some of those things that, that people do with their life, and it just, just, it just hits you? Why are you doing that? Why would you do that? Why would you eat like that? Why would, we can laugh at them, but then it hits me. Why am I watching this? What am I doing? T -t Today, I want us to ask this question, why do we do what we do? You ever thought about that? Why am I doing this with, with my life? Have you ever looked at your life, you just looked in the mirror and thought, what, what am I doing? Well, what am I accomplishing? Why am I doing what, I'm in, what I am doing with my life? This, this is the Olympics right now, and it? I love watching them run and swim and, and, and everything. And, and, and I love the Olympics. During the last Olympics, I was, I was home alone during the afternoon, and I thought, I'm going to watch something. Something's got to be on, right? And, and so I turned the television on, and the only thing that was on was the trampoline competition. Did you even know we had a trampoline competition Olympics. I didn't know that. I, and I thought, I, I'm not going to watch the trampoline competition. And then they said, coming up, the American. Oh, come on, you know, go USA. And uh, I, I, what I, what I did learn was this, we are not good at the trampoline competition. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you this. So, so my wife knew that I was going to tell this little story today. And so this morning she sent me, because yesterday afternoon, the, the men's trampoline competition. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that funny? So she, she sent me the story. Our guy, our main comp, uh, competitor in the tra trampoline com competition, he fell through the trampoline. <laughs> he, oh, he's out before he even qualified. We're not good at the trampoline. We are, we are good at basketball. We are, we are, we are good at swimming. We are, we're good at track and field. We're, we're terrible at the trampoline. So, so a few years ago, the last Olympics, I was watching, I started watching the trampoline competition. You know, and you just, you, this is what, you just watch, you just watch them. They go up and down. And down. So finally, we get to the American, I'm like, okay, come on, I got a few minutes here. Let's, let's. So I watched. I watched our guy up. And go way up. Our guy started good. He started way up, way up. He went way up. And I watched him come down, and he missed the trampoline. Our guy. Like, what? He was terrible. And I was just watching, and they interviewed him. You know, he's standing there. <sighs> yeah. I said, so what, what happened out there? He said, he said this, listen, 12 years of training, gone in 20 seconds. That's right. He said, I was telling myself to go big. It's the Olympics. If you're going to go big, this is the time. But he caught my attention with the phrase. Do you hear that? He had invested 12 years of his life to jumping on a trampoline. And then it just kind of hit me, I'm thinking about that, this poor, pathetic, trampoline-bouncing man. He had dedicated the last 12 years of his life to doing what my grandkids can do out in my backyard, right? Isn't it amazing? It's just amazing to me what some people live and die for, what they give all of themselves to do doesn't make a difference. We enjoy watching people. They have given their life to eating hot dogs, to making paper airplanes, to jumping on a trampoline. To get to this question, why do you do what you do? What are you doing with your life? What is it that, that, that you spend all of your life doing? Uh, today we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you want to find that with me. 
This chapter is important. It's going to contain some verses that are probably pretty familiar to you. And today you're going to see the context in which they were written. So you probably, if you have been in church for a while, you, you may understand the reason there's a letter to the Corinthians. The Apostle Paul spent his life, his adult life, going around starting churches. He would have a, a, a person or two with him, and they would go to a place, and they would go into that community, and they would start a church. Well, he went to the city of Corinth with a couple of people, and he literally kind of dropped them off and, and went on his way. And they started a church in their home. And that church grew, and it became kind of, a, kind of an interesting situation. The church at Corinth. And that church had some serious problems. So they wrote to the Apostle Paul and they said, we got some problems, what do we do? So they wrote him this letter and so the Apostle Paul writes back to them and he says, this is what you do. This, 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 this. That's the letter of 1 Corinthians. So time goes by just a little while longer. They do what Paul tells them and things get a little bit better, but then they write to the Apostle Paul again and they say, Paul, we... we we got some more issues, but Paul, we don't need a letter. Paul, we want you. We need you, Paul. Would you come? And Paul is about to tell them. He said, I am out doing what God called me to do. I can't come, and, and, and I'll tell you why I do what I do. That's what we get in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says, no matter where I'm at, whether I am with you or whether I'm someplace else, I am giving myself fully to, to starting churches and, and telling people about the gospel that have never heard about Jesus. He said, I, I have to go out and do this. So he writes them a letter telling them all of that, and that's the letter of 2 Corinthians. And then we get to chapter 5, and Paul says, this is why I do what I do. And that's what I want you to see today. That's what I want us to learn together today. Why do I do what I do? And honestly, this, is, this, this convicts me every time I look at this. And, and I hope maybe today it might change somebody's view of what they're doing with their life. Or maybe even the trajectory or, or what you're, 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 you're preparing your life to do. So, so in, in this chapter... Why do we do what we do? Paul starts out by saying, you know why I am doing this, why I am going all over the, the, the place, starting churches and preaching the gospel. You know why I do? Because God wants us to. That's why. It's, it's, it's not a hard reason. It's, it's not a difficult thing to understand. I have to do this because this is what God wants us to do. Why do you do what you do? Paul says, he says this, look at verse 9. Paul says, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. Now, now this, is, this is an important thing to break down. There's, there's a couple things I want you to see in this verse. He said, whether I am present or absent, whether I am with you or whether I am someplace else, I have to do what God has called me to do with my life. I have to be about doing what God has called me to do. So if I'm with you or not, I have to do this because, because, notice, we may be accepted of him. I have to do what God has called me to do so that my life is acceptable to him. You know, that tells me a couple things. It tells me that there is a way to live my life that is acceptable to God. That's the question for you. Are you living your life so that it is acceptable to God? You know what that also says? That if you are not living your life that is an acceptable way to God, there is also a way to live your life that is not acceptable to God. And that's a, that's a difficult position to be in before God. How am I spending my life? I get, I get one shot with my life. I loved being a pastor. I was a pastor for 25 years, building a couple churches that just grew and grew. And, and in my last church, we, we were getting ready to build this big, huge building, an auditorium. And I got a call from the trustees from Baptist Bible College asking if I would come to be the president. And I, 
I told them no several times because I love being a pastor. Our, our ministry was just, it was just so exciting and fun and, and growing. And it's just, it was just such an exciting time of life. I thought, I can't, I can't do this. I can't. And it hit me one day that if I stayed there, we could reach thousands for Christ. But if I went to Baptist Bible College and poured my life into men and women that are going to go out and reach people, we could reach millions for Christ. That, that's why I do what I do. Why, why do you do what you do? Paul says it doesn't matter where I'm at. I'm going to live in such a way so that my life is acceptable to God. I'm going to give the one shot I have and make the most difference possible. Why do we do what we do first? It's because God wants us to. The second reason is this. Because what we do will last. I don't think we think about that enough. I think we waste a lot of our life doing things because we don't understand that what I'm doing is going to last forever. Look at, look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So verse 9 talks about what we are doing. We're, we're doing this work for this reason. Verse 10 says, why? Do you know why you go and do what you do? Do you know why missionaries go? Do you know why pastors go? Do you know why you spend your life the way you do? It's because what you do will last for all of eternity. Because one day, we're going to give an answer for our work. An answer for our words. An answer for our actions. This is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I want you to understand this. I'm going to explain this. This is where believers, where Christians will stand one day. There's another place. There's a, the, the great white throne judgment. That's where unbelievers will stand. That will not be a fun thing to stand before one day if you do not know Jesus Christ. That's the day when people will be told they're going to hell. You can stand before Christ if you know him. You, you need to make sure of that today. One day, one day, we will all, believers in Christ, we will stand before Jesus Christ. It will be a powerful situation. What are you going to say when he says, what did you do with your life? Well, well, can, can you just imagine that? Imagine, I don't, I don't know what it will be like, but I know this, that one day we will stand before Christ and we will have to give an answer for how we lived. We'll have to give an answer for, for what we did with our time, an answer about our sin. We will answer for what we said with our words. We will answer for what we gave or what we didn't give. Can, can you think about that? Can you just imagine that picture? one day standing before Jesus Christ and he looks right at you and he says what did you do with your life me Jesus well I ate a lot of hot dogs is what I did is what I did <laughs> me I made a lot of paper airplanes. That's what I did. Yeah. Who, me, Jesus? I jumped on a trampoline for 12 years is what I did with my life. What are you going to say? Some of you are going to say, oh, Jesus, I worshiped you. Jesus, I, I, I gave you my life. I told my family all about you. I told my friends all about you. Oh, Jesus. Some of you are going to say, oh, Jesus, I, I served over at Grace Church. Oh, I, 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 I work with the kids, and I told them all about you. I, 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 I work with the teens, or, or I, I sang, I served, I cleaned, I cooked, I, I, I greeted, I, I helped out in the tech area. I did, Lord Jesus, I, I did whatever I could to, to, to help you. What are you going to say one day when Jesus looks at you and says, what did you do with the life I gave you? What are you going to say? Why do we do what we do? Because God wants us to. 
because what we do will last. The third reason is this. Why do you do what you do? Because eternity is real. This is probably the most important point I can give you today. This is the one that impacts me every day, convicts me when I walk into my office there to make sure that we are on track doing what we are supposed to be doing. Why? Because in verse 11, Paul says this, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Paul Paul says we work to persuade people to believe in Christ because heaven and hell are real. They're real. Paul says we we have to understand it's just not all heaven. There is a terror side, a judgment side to God. We forget that. And so often we can live every day like heaven and hell don't really matter or don't exist. Every day we walk by people, we talk to people, and we never think about the fact where they might be headed for all of eternity. If that would grip our hearts, it would change who we are. When's the last time that you were moved? When's the last time your heart was heavy? When's the last time you were stirred to tears because someone you loved, someone that's close to you, someone that you know is not on their way to heaven? Do we we care about people anymore like that? It's not popular to talk about, or or it's not popular to say you believe that, that hell is real. But the Bible describes a literal place of burning fire. And listen, we cannot say that we believe this and ignore what it says about eternity and hell and the destiny for those that reject Christ. The, the Apostle Paul, he couldn't stand the thought of, of people going to hell. And so it motivated him. And would to God that we would remember why we exist, why we do what we do. You know why we do what we do? Because eternity is real. That's why Baptist Bible College exists. We we exist to train men and women to use their life to reach this world for Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what degree you take at Baptist Bible College. You're going to get all the Bible. You're going to get all the ministry training and service and expectations. So so it doesn't matter where you go, whether you stay in the United States or go to a foreign country or work in 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 a school classroom or a business. You are trained to share your faith. You are trained to take the gospel to anybody around you, no matter what you're doing or where you're at. That's why we do what we do. Let me ask you, why do you exist, Grace Church? This is the bottom line reason. Heaven and hell are real. Listen, I love the local church. I've given it so many years of my life to it. I, I, I've led churches, and I can look at a church bulletin. I can, I, can, I can look at a church. Well, I can tell you all about a church because every church, we, we have programs for men. We have programs for women. We have programs for kids. We have programs for teens. We have, we have Bible studies. We have parties. We have, we have food together a lot, don't we? We, we? we like to do all kind of things. But here's the deal. All of those things, you know why a church does those? is to help you grow, is to help you build up, is to help you become a person that is able to share Christ with somebody, getting you stronger, getting you more knowledgeable, getting you you together with a group so that together we can go out and make a difference in this world for Christ. Here's the deal. If at any time those things are not helping you grow towards being able to do that, you need to get rid of them as a church. That's not why you exist. It's just to hear, come and have fun and, and, and hang out. We are here to grow together to make a difference in this world. That's the bottom line. Why else would we do all of this? That's why Baptist Bible College exists. That's why Grace Church exists, so that you can reach people with the gospel of Christ. So, so it's important for us to know why we do what we do. That's the bottom line reason. Paul Paul says this, the fourth reason, why do we do what we do? 
because Christ deserves it. If, if no other reason, Paul says, let me tell you, I, I, I can't help but do this because I know what Jesus did for me. L listen to what he says, verse 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth or compels or makes us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Paul is very simply saying, how can I not serve him with my life? I know what he did for me. I, I love this about the Apostle Paul. No matter what, what you read that he wrote, he never got over being saved. He never got over the fact that I was a terrible sinner and I did so many things against God. But Jesus loved me too. And Jesus gave his life for me. He saved me. He forgave me. Can, can you remember that in your life? Can you remember when that happened to you? How many of you would be headed in the absolute wrong direction if Jesus hadn't found you and come into your home? Jesus changes lives. He turns lives around. He saves us from destruction. And sometimes we get over it. Sometimes we, we forget about it. How many in here would say, oh, my life was headed in the wrong direction, but thank God Jesus came by my life and shook me and saved me. It's changed where I'm going for all of eternity. And I could never forget that. I could never get over that. That's why I do what I do today with my life. How about, how about you? Can, can you think about the fact that Jesus saved you? You may, you may think, yeah, I'm pretty good. That's why Jesus wants me and his. The Bible tells us we're nothing but dirty, rotten sinners. And, and by, by believing in him, we can be changed, and he can use our life. And Paul says, I can never get over it. That's what, I lo that's what I love about Pastor Joey. He never got over being saved. He recognized who he was and where his life was headed and what happened when Jesus came in. How, how about you? Can, can you see what Jesus has done in your life? We could never, ever give enough or serve enough or love enough or deserve what Christ has done for us. The love of Christ, Paul says, constrains or compels. Or I, he, he says, it makes me. He loved me so much, I can't help but give him my life. That's why I do what I do. Why do we do what we do? The fifth reason is this, because lives can be made new. You've probably heard this verse, but this is the context. This is the motivator for the Apostle Paul. Verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This is just a reminder that no matter who you are, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you have done, no matter the depth of your sin, you can be brand new right now. You may have come in here, to, I don't know your stories. You may have come in here today just looking for something, anything. I got to get off this. I got to start new. I, my life is headed in the wrong direction. You may have just come here looking for something. This is the message for you. Your life can be new right now by believing in Jesus Christ, by giving your life to him. He takes all the bad away. He takes all the sin, all the guilt, and he says, I got this. You are brand new today. You get to start brand new today. Maybe that's what somebody in here needs today. You need to start. You need a new life. And so all of those that have come in here with that story, and maybe some of you have somebody in your own home. Maybe have somebody around you, somebody that you know and love that need Jesus Christ. This short verse, such a powerful promise to any life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You want to get rid of the old stuff? old things are passed away you want to have a new life it starts right there all of that Jesus died to pay for the sin of the world and by believing in him your life can be clean instantly Paul says that's why I do what I do the sixth and final reason is this why do we do what we do it's because it's up to us why do we go out? Why do we give our lives? Why do we do all this? It's because there's a job to accomplish. And, 
and, and the Apostle Paul says, it's, it's been given to me to do, and now I'm giving it to you. And he's talking, not just to those read that letter in Corinth, he's talking, that letter is now written to you and to me. Listen to what he says, verse 18 through 21. Listen to who the ministry of reconciling man to God has been given. The gospel, that's what it is. Listen to who the job has been given to. Verse 18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. He's saying Christ took all of our, our trespasses and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, the gospel. This is how you bring God and man together. The job of telling the world that is up to us. Verse 20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ dead be reconciled to God. For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God has called us to be his ambassadors. That means we are to represent him in this world. We are, we are to take his saving message around the world. That's his plan. It is now our plan. It is up to us. God has a plan to reach this world, and that involves you and involves me. Maybe, maybe today you, you, you have come in here and, and, it's, and it's something you've been thinking about. Maybe, maybe God is stirring your heart about using you in a, in a ministry someplace. Maybe, maybe you are being called to go into a full-time ministry situation someplace. Maybe you, are, maybe you just have a burden. Maybe you see the pictures of, of, of kids from Guatemala or, 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 or Philippines or, or something. Maybe God is stirring your heart to become a missionary someplace. Here's the deal. If God is not calling you to go, then he's calling you to stay and do the same thing right here. He's calling every single one of us, no matter who you are, to do something with your life where you are. And that may be right here. God, God never expects any of us to not be serving in our church. So, so let, me, let me challenge you, and it's easier. I don't go here. I can be a lot more blunt and, and a little, little, bit, little bit more in, in, in your face about this. Every single person that comes here needs to be doing something. Where are you going to serve? And you may be thinking, you know, I, I've thought about it. I can, I, I love them kids. I, I'd love to be able to tell them about what Jesus has done in my life. Maybe you think, I, I can sing. I, I can play. I can, I can do the technical stuff. I can greet. I can fix stuff. I can. What, what is it that God has, has gifted your life to do? That's what you're to be doing. You don't want to look back and say, I jumped on a trampoline for 12 years. You want to say, this is what I did with my life. Let me ask you this question. How is the world going to be any different because of you? Several years ago, as I was finishing serving as a pastor, I got a call from the local funeral home to do the funeral for an older lady. She had passed away and didn't have a church home. Family didn't have a church. Asked me if I would do the service. I said, sure, sure, I'd be glad to help. And so I set up a meeting with the family, her kids. She had three kids, and, and I, I set up a meeting with them so that I could learn about her and some personal things so I could just minister to the family better. And so, so I met with them in this little conference room at the funeral home, and I, I, I sat down with my pad of paper, and I just always do this, and I just said, well, l l let me learn about your mom, would you? Where was she born? Where did she grow up? You know, all those, where did she go to school? When did she meet your dad? Where did they live? And what did he do? And, and tell me about your, your mom. Tell me, what did, what did she do? Well, what, what did, did she 
do something that, that people enjoyed, or did she, well, what did she do that she might be known for? I said, are there any, any accomplishments in her life that I can mention? What was she known for? What did she do that something might recognize? And they just looked at each other, and there's nothing. I kept pressing, so, so what was she like? What was she doing with her life? You know what, they, they didn't say, well, she was a good mom. They didn't say that. She was a busy mom. She didn't say that. She, she, I, I, sometimes I get this, oh, she always had us. She loved the holidays, and she would always cook, and she would always, didn't say any of that. They said nothing. This woman had lived her whole life and had done nothing. And I just kept asking them, trying to figure this out. And finally, one of them said, one year, she was the president of her bingo club. I'm like, well, there you go. So I wrote down, president of bingo club. I, I you know, I, I did the funeral service for the president. I did the gravesite ceremony for the president of the bingo club. But it just kind of disgusted me a little bit. It just didn't, it just, just kind of kind of made me mad. And it just, after I was all done, I was driving back to my office, and I just, I said, dear, dear God, I just, when, when it is my time, please help me to have done something how many of you have done something with my life that makes a difference in this world? So, so the question is, what are you doing with your life? Well, what is it that you're doing with your life? Maybe today God has brought you here so that you would look at yourself in a mirror and ask, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? You have an opportunity today to give your life to him right now. Maybe, maybe you've come in here and, and you've been around church enough and you, you've heard enough about Jesus. that Maybe you realize you've never really given your life to him. Maybe right now that's what you need to do. But maybe you've known Jesus for a long time, but you look at your life and you're convicted about what you're doing with your life that you do have. Maybe today is the day you make a change. You, 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 you decide, I'm all in now. I am going to live so that my life makes a difference in people's lives for all of eternity. Let's bow our head together, all right? Would you, would you bow your head and just... Let me, let, me, let me go back to an important thought that we discussed, and that's this. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Has he cleansed your life? Have you let him in? Are you, are you following after him? Do you know him today? If you don't, I would love to pray with you because today, right now, you can be made brand new. What an opportunity for you to come in and then leave on your way to heaven. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you've known Jesus Christ for a while and today you recognize I haven't been doing much. Let, let me encourage you to just decide today, I want my life to make a difference. I, I, I want to use my life. I want to serve. I want to help. I want to minister. I want to witness. I want to do whatever I can so that my life makes an eternal difference. Would you listen to God today? Would you listen to his call in your life? Would you listen to the Holy Spirit moving and stirring your heart? Very quietly, let's stand together. Let's stand together. If, if I can pray with you, if there are others that will pray with you, if you have questions about Jesus Christ and 
what it means to be saved and what it, what it means to have him come into your life, we'd be, we'd be glad to talk to you about that. But maybe today the message is, I, I want to do something important for God. Maybe today you would just like to come just, just to allow us to pray with you about that. What does God want me to do? So while, while we, just, we just have some background music, very simply, now's a great time. If you would like to come, we'd love to pray with you about whatever is going on. And, and honestly, let me open this up. Maybe there is a need in your life. Maybe there's something.